Welcome to our Health, Safety, and Environment channel. Why does God allow suffering? Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get understanding. Proverbs 4 verse 7. Suffering is really part of life. The times we are currently experiencing because of famines, climatic disasters, war and its escort of malnourished and war-displaced people, and pandemics of all kinds, remind us of how suffering our world is. How to cope with suffering? Are we really victims of the wrath of an angry God who delights in torturing us? Or are we also responsible for our misfortunes? In fact, Scripture announces that the worst is yet to come. If we open the holy books, we find more than 25 Bible verses on the wrath of God and its devastating consequences. Then my anger shall be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them, and I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, Are not these evils come upon us, because our God is not among us. Deuteronomy 31 verse 17 Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Isaiah 13 verse 9 Praise the Lord, the same scriptures console us in these words, the future of believers in Jesus Christ is incomparably glorious. Romans 8, 17, 18. The Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, affirms that we are co-heirs of Christ if we suffer with him in order to be glorified with him. But if we are honest, we find this idea very difficult to accept. Pain hurts, very hurt. In verse 18, Paul encourages us thus, I believe that the sufferings of the present time cannot be compared with the coming glory that will be revealed for us. To prove that the glory to come will exceed even our dreams, Paul draws our attention to creation, to the universe that God created. He said in verse 19, Therefore creation awaits with ardent desire the revelation of the children of God. Do you want to know how glorious the future of Christians will be? Look at creation, says the Apostle Paul, for the whole creation looks forward to the moment when the children of God will be revealed when Jesus returns at the end of time. The whole creation is waiting for this. But creation has been subjected to vanity, with the hope that one day this very creation will be freed from the bondage of corruption, to share in the glorious freedom of God's children. The whole universe is waiting for one thing, the return of Jesus and the eternal life that Christians will have. Jesus also reassures his disciples not to be troubled by the misfortunes that will occur towards the end of time. When you hear about wars and rumors of wars, don't be troubled because these things have to happen. But it won't be the end yet. A nation will rise against a nation and a kingdom against a kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This will only be the beginning of pain. Let's go back to our subject. What does the dictionary say about suffering? Suffering is the feeling of physical or moral pain. Synonyms are affliction, injury, grief, tearing, pain, trial, pain, torture, torment. Some concrete examples. Hunger, cold, physical pain, toothache, back pain, etc. Moral pain, abandonment, rejection, judgment, etc. There is no need to do a thorough study to realize the dark and negative side of this classic approach. According to Sigmund Freud, suffering is one of the essential coordinates of human experience, and our existence consists largely in an attempt to reduce suffering. Ultimately, the principle of pleasure itself is inseparable from a relentless quest to reduce suffering. It is clear that the suffering of modern times would come above all from the unbridled pursuit of pleasures. In recent times, ordinary citizens are richer than the rich kings of the ancient kingdoms. Driving vehicles of more than 600 horses and dressing even more than King Solomon. Today's people covet the most expensive and sophisticated gadgets from the gems in the basement. The environment is suffering more, and the consequences of these environmental injuries are quickly causing more harm and creating more difficult times. We live in a world of duality, where the search for intense joy is in opposition, but in harmony with the exacerbated suffering. The Apostle Paul warned Timothy, his spiritual son, in these words, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, 
false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such turn away. 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5. We agree that the abuses of people can absolutely cause their suffering. But we also find in the book of Job that even the righteous are tested by suffering. Jesus even specifies that it is not because the 18 people on whom the tower of Shiloh fell and she killed were more guilty than all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. According to all these scriptures, we have just realized that God allows suffering to reach us and that it is even unnecessary to want to understand this absurdity of suffering. It is important to give a clear definition of pain-related suffering to indicate from the outset its dimension of singular experience affecting many registers of existence. Pain, in fact, is not only physical. It is a global and moving experience, incorporating physical, psychic, social, and spiritual elements. Christianity has often been criticized for advocating suffering. This was perhaps the case with the concept of redemptive suffering. Surely misunderstood, but at the same time, many elements go against this approach since the cry of revolt of Joel. Christ, through his entire ministry of healing, has done only one thing. Try to raise the human from a physical, psychic, social, and religious point of view. Faith in his death resurrection also testifies to God's will to tear every human from this confinement. The suffering in the book of Genesis does not appear until after the fall. He tells the woman, I will increase the suffering of your pregnancies. You will give birth with pain. Genesis 3 verse 16. The original creation is therefore good, harmonious and orderly, free from all suffering. The new world, the object of the hope of both the Old and the New Testament, is also a world where suffering does not exist. We read in Isaiah, the old sufferings will be forgotten. I will make Jerusalem my joy and my people my joy. There will be no more noise of weeping and shouting. Isaiah 65, 18, 19. The Apostle John, in Revelation, sees a new heaven and a new earth where there will be no more death, no mourning, no lamentation, no pain. The old things will have disappeared. Revelation 21, 1, 4. In other words, suffering is not inevitable. It is linked to the condition of the sinful man. It is one of the signs of the disorder introduced into creation by the attitude of man. In a more theological language, we will say that it is the consequence of man's revolt against God. It shows the grip of sin on man. No one escapes him. Sin is not simply a succession of behaviors or acts that the human could avoid or repair. Sin is a state in which man finds himself and against which he can do nothing. He is part of the human condition, and Jesus Christ, to enter this human condition, will also have to suffer. Hebrews 2, 14, 18. Suffering is therefore inevitable, and the temptation of man will be to believe that, being able to stop sin, he will be able to stop suffering. It is the cry of despair, I did not kill, I did not steal, I did not commit adultery, and so on. So why am I suffering? The Old Testament presents misfortunes as collective punishments that God sends to unfaithful people. See, for example, the first two chapters of the book of Amos. The prophets interpret the history of Israel and the nations in this sense, but for them the painful punishment retains the value of a call to repentance. This is not divine vengeance, it is an invitation to change. In Deuteronomy 28, in some Psalms, such as Psalm 49 and 52, in Proverbs, suffering appears as a definitive punishment reserved for the wicked. In Lower Judaism and in the eschatology of the New Testament, it became a definitive punishment after death under the figure of the place of torment which is hell. Luke 16 verse 24, Revelation 20 verse 10. But conversely, in the book of Job, the author rises up against this idea that man suffers according to his sins. Divine justice is not linked to human merits. In response to his friends defending this thesis, Job claims his innocence. For him, the justice of God is far above all our doubts and remains mysterious until the day our soul will understand. The Book of Lamentations makes a similar note. We must know how to listen to the silence of God Lamentations 3 verse 26. Jesus' teaching prolongs Job's discovery. Some will go so far as to say that Joel, by his sufferings, foreshadows the life of Jesus, the suffering servant. None of man does not question the origin of suffering. His answers are sovereign. It was an enemy who did this. Matthew 13 verse 28. Or it is not the will of my Father. Matthew 18 verse 14, 
In Jesus' answers, God's justice appears to be good, and if it were exercised in our regard, what would be our fate? Those on whom the Tower of Shiloh fell are no more sinful than the others, as are the parents of the born blind man. It is no accident that we suffer. For the disciple of Christ, affliction comes from the opposition between the ideal to which he strives to conform and the reality of the world. In wanting to serve his master, he encounters the opposition of men. Matthew 24, verse 9. Is it not for the same reason that Jesus was in pain? He fully lives God's plan for man. It is unbearable to men who want a God and not someone who reveals to them the fullness of humanity. Jesus does not suffer as a hero or as a martyr. He suffers because he dares to go to the limits of the human. He does not refuse these limits because they were asked of him by his Father. He the Son of Man behaves as the Son of God. Those who today, under the pretext of looking at men, refuse Christ are on the wrong track. For who other than Jesus has gone to the end of his humanity? And those who today, under the pretext of holiness, would like to look to God and to God alone, are also on the wrong track, because God's passion is man in his total humanity, always aimed at, never reached. Today, in a desire to give glory to God, whatever his name, many make man perish. It is a double path of folly since, destroying humanity, they are forever moving away from God. The Apostle Paul goes so far as to say that man shares in the suffering of Christ, and that we suffer because we are co-heirs of Christ. This is the path that has been drawn. Today, what can we say about suffering? Suffering reflects our personal history. It is no accident that we suffer. Suffering, whether physical or psychic, translates our experience, personal experience and social experience. Suffering is the involuntary expression of man in a given environment. It has something to do with existence. It is both a reaction to external and internal stimuli to our person, and a state that lasts as long as life lasts. There is a pain in every human being. This pain can have very different manifestations, and we would be mistaken if we perceived it only in the form of spleen or depressive state. For psychoanalysts, bodily pain can be a symptom, that is, the substitutive satisfaction of a repressed impulse. It is the purest form of enjoyment, that is, the means by which the body is tested, strengthened and defended, and they cite as examples headaches or low back pain. But we could mention many other diseases, including some cancers, so-called viral diseases, or addictive behaviors, still too often perceived as vices. Suffering leads us to reconsider our way of life. Suffering is a tension in daily life. As time goes by, the whole activity is organized around it. It captures all the energy of the sufferer as of those around him promotes the extravagant development of the self, which is most often reduced to the attacked organ. The patient only talks about the part he suffers from. Like the love state, it separates what was connected and makes new connections. This is, for example, the case of the parents who separate after the death of one of their children in favor of liaisons without tomorrow, more positively. It is the example of Job who separates from his friends for new destinies. Suffering leads the individual to reconsider his past, his existence. It invites a new organization of personal life. It forces us to redefine relations with others. In short, it challenges those who, without it, might have remained deaf. Suffering contributes to the constitution of the self. Pain allows us to constitute the self because through it, we represent the body. Now in the course of life, every being has the opportunity to invest in turn, for small or great pains, the different parts of the body. It is from these sensory perceptions and other representations forming in the psyche that the self will be born. Thus, by successive touches, being is built in its deepest humanity. Is this not the reason why it is said that Christ had to suffer? He who had to go to the limits of the human condition. And today, when we affirm with the scriptures that Christ died for us, we do not say that he suffered in our place and that we should no longer suffer at all. We say that he draws us into the depths of humanity the one we were made for. In the book of Genesis, it is said that God made man in his own image and likeness. Genesis 1 verse 26. And then, a verse later, we find only the image. If we reject the hypothesis that the loss of resemblance is only a matter of the uncaring copyist, we can think that being already by birth, in the image of God, Jesus Christ leads us along the path of resemblance, resemblance to man as the Creator intended and programmed. Jesus leads us in the realization of this program. 
The Apostle Paul will say that we are participants in Christ's suffering for the realization of this good news. Suffering structures the personality. Besides bodily pain, there is a psychic suffering that we could call separation pain. The life of every human is made of ruptures. They cause loss and abandonment of the object, of a person or of a loved thing. These separations are painful, even momentarily. Just watch the young child cry in the schoolyard when the mother is away. To avoid them would be for the human to condemn himself not to grow up by remaining fixed in childish stages. Blessed is he who has failed to avoid them. Ruptures and separations, despite the pain they cause, allow the personality to be structured. In more theological language, we will say that they allow man to present himself by his name before God. Let's recall here a funny episode of the Gospels, that of Jesus as a child escaping into the temple. So before God, to the great despair of parents who do not want to let go of him. We could also recall the story of Abraham, who knew how to hear the call and to tear himself away from his country, his homeland and his father's house, to become a man. And what a man. In leaving his country, he prophesied with his feet in the sense that he set in motion a future quite different from the one he would have known if he had remained at Ur in Chaldea. But could he have left without tearing when there was no hope of return, given the means of communication of the time? It is because he knew how to go from shore to shore in a forward march, listening to the call, that he became Abraham from Abram, in other words, born again. From pain, a new being is born. This pain due to separation cannot be avoided, it can simply be accompanied. Delivery is not painless. In conclusion, we are not apologizing for pain. As we said at the beginning, the biblical message says nothing about pain itself. It insists on the meaning and the questioning that it constitutes. Suffering is inscribed in humanity itself. This does not mean that we should not calm it during acute crises, but we cannot ignore it and pretend it is not, because it is a call to life. Whether man chooses to suffer in a masochistic manner or whether he seeks to avoid suffering. He can only be challenged by it. We can find in our dailyreview.org 10 reasons to believe in a God who allows suffering. One, suffering comes with freedom to choose. Every loving parent wants to protect their children from unnecessary suffering. Nevertheless, wise parents know the danger of overprotecting their children. They know that free choice is at the heart of human experience and that a world without freedom would be worse than a world without suffering. Worse still would be a world inhabited by people who would make bad choices without suffering. There is no more dangerous person than a liar, a thief or a murderer who does not feel the harm he does to himself and to others. Two, suffering can warn us of danger. We hate suffering, especially in those we love. Yet without discomfort, the patient would not go to a doctor. The exhausted body would not rest. The criminal would not fear the law. The child would not care to be corrected. Without the instances of consciousness, the daily dissatisfaction that boredom creates, and the unfulfilled desire for meaning in their lives, people who are made to find satisfaction in an eternal father would be satisfied with much less. The example of Solomon, deceived by pleasures and taught by his sufferings, shows us that even the wisest among us have a tendency to move away from good and God, until the suffering resulting from his own short-sighted choices dissuades him from going further Ecclesiastes 1 12. Psalm 78 34 35 Romans 3 10 18 3. Suffering reveals what is in the heart. Suffering often results from the actions of others. However, it has its own way of revealing to us what is in our own hearts. The ability to love, to use mercy, to be irritated, to envy and to take pride can lie dormant in us until a certain situation awakens her. The strength and weakness of the heart are discovered not when everything goes as we wish, but when the flames of suffering and temptation come to test our character. As fire is used to refine gold and silver, and coal needs time and pressure to change into diamond, the human heart reveals itself and develops by bearing the pressure and heat of time and situations. Strength of character is shown not when all is well in our world, but in the presence of human pain and suffering Job 42 117, Romans 5 3 5, James 1 2 5, 1 Peter 1 6 9. 4. Suffering leads us to the threshold of eternity. If death marks the end of everything, then a life filled with suffering is unjust. However, if the end of life here below leads us to the threshold of eternity, 
then the people who are most fortunate in the universe are those who discover through suffering that life here below is not everything. Those who discover themselves and their eternal God through suffering have not suffered in vain. They allowed their poverty, grief, and hunger to lead them to the Lord of eternity. They are those who will discover to their eternal joy why Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Matthew 5, 1, 12 and Romans 8, 18, 19. 5. Suffering releases our control over life. As time goes on, our demands for work and opinions diminish. Our body's condition worsens more and more through wear and tear. Eventually, it becomes obsolete. Joints stiffen and hurt. Sight weakens. Digestion slows. Sleep becomes difficult. The problems are growing while the options are diminishing. Yet if death does not mark the end, but the beginning of a new day, then the curse of old age is also a blessing. Each new pain makes our world less inviting and life to come more attractive. In its own way, suffering paves the way for a departure in grace. Ecclesiastes 12, 1, 14. 6. Suffering gives an opportunity to trust in God. Famous for this reason, Job is the man who has suffered most of all time. According to the Bible, Job lost his family because of a great wind, his wealth because of war and fire, and his health because of painful ulcers. Despite everything, God never told Job why all this was happening to him. While Job suffered the accusations of his friends, heaven kept silent. When God finally spoke, he did not reveal to him that Satan, his sworn enemy, had cast doubt on Job's motives for serving God. Nor did God ask Job to excuse him for allowing Satan to test his consecration to God. Instead, God told him about wild goats giving birth, cubs hunting and scavengers in their nests. He evoked the behavior of the ostrich, the strength of the buffalo, and the stride of the horse. He evoked the wonders of the heavens and the sea, and the cycle of the seasons. Job could only conclude that, if God had the power and wisdom to create our physical universe, we would be right to trust that same God in times of suffering. Job 1 to 42. 7. God suffers with us when we suffer. No one has suffered more than our Heavenly Father. No one has paid a higher price for free will, which has allowed sin to enter the world. No one has stopped suffering so much for a race that suffers because it has taken the wrong path. No one has suffered as he who paid for our sins in the crucified body of his own son. No one has suffered more than the one who, when he stretched out his arms and gave up his soul, showed us how much he loves us. It is this God who, in drawing us to himself, asks us to trust him when we suffer and when those we love cry in our presence. 1 Peter 2 verse 21 and 3 verse 18 and 4 verse 1. God cares about your suffering because he knows what it is to suffer. God visited the earth in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, and he suffered through torture and brutal death on a cross. His death was even worse because he was perfect. Jesus did nothing wrong and did not deserve to die. The Bible says, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of pain and familiar with suffering. Isaiah 53 verse three, his suffering was more intense than anything we could ever know because he bore the sins of the whole world. He did so willingly because he loved us and wanted to do everything possible to bring us forgiveness and surrender to God. God has not forsaken you and is with you in your pain. When you trust in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, you can be sure that nothing in this world, not even suffering, can separate you from the goodness and love of God. The Bible promises that nothing can ever separate us from the love of God. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor our fears for today, nor our worries for tomorrow. Even the powers of hell cannot separate us from the love of God. No power in heaven or on earth, in fact. Nothing in all creation can ever separate us from the love of God revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 8, 38 to 39. Everything changes when your attention moves away from your painful circumstances and you look at Jesus. Open your heart to him and thank him that he loved you enough to go to the cross. Then you will understand what the Bible says. If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for all of us, will he not also give us all the rest? Romans 8, 31, 32. 8. God's consolation surpasses our suffering. The Apostle Paul begged the Lord to take away an unidentified source of suffering. 
But the Lord refused him, saying, My grace is enough for you, for my power is fulfilled in weakness. To this Paul replied, I will therefore gladly glorify myself of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. That is why I like myself in weaknesses, in outrages, in calamities, in persecutions, in distress, for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. 2 Corinthians 12, 9-10 Apostle Paul discovered that he would rather be with Christ in suffering than to be without Christ in good health and in a pleasant situation. 9. In times of crisis, we find each other. No one would choose pain and suffering. However, when we have no choice, we are left with consolation. Natural disasters and times of crisis have their way of bringing us closer together. Hurricanes, fires, earthquakes, riots, diseases and accidents all have their own ways of bringing us to our senses. Suddenly we remember our own mortality and that people matter more than things. We remember that we need each other and above all, we need God. Every time we discover God's consolation in the midst of our sufferings, our ability to help others is increased. This is what the Apostle Paul had in mind when he wrote, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. 2 Corinthians 1 3 4. 10. God can change suffering into good for us. This truth is best seen in the many examples of the Bible. In the midst of Job's sufferings, we see a man coming not only to acquire a deeper understanding of God, but also to become a source of encouragement for the people of all the generations that followed. In the midst of the rejection, betrayal, slavery, and unjustified imprisonment of a man by the name of Joseph, we see someone who has come to say to those who have wronged him, you had meditated to harm me. God has changed him into good. Genesis 50 verse 20. When everything in us cries out to heaven for allowing suffering, we are right to fix our eyes on the eternal result and joy of Jesus, who himself cried out suffering martyrdom on the cross of an executioner. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Matthew 27 verse 46. You are not the only one if the injustice and suffering in life make you doubt that a God in heaven cares about you. However, consider again the suffering of one whom the prophet Isaiah described as a man of pain and accustomed to suffering. Isaiah 53 verse 3. Think of his lacerated back, his bloodied forehead, his fingernails torn from his hands and feet, his pierced side, his agony in the garden, and his cry of heartbreaking abandonment. Consider Christ's statement that he suffered not because of his sins, but because of ours. To give us the freedom to choose, it allows us to suffer. Yet he himself suffered supreme punishment and suffering for all our sins. 2 Corinthians 5 verses 21 and 1 Peter 2 verses 24. Watch out! Make no mistake, the forgiveness and eternal life that God offers us is not a reward for efforts made, but a gift made to all those who, in the light of the evidence, put their trust in Him. Are we really responsible for our pain? Affirmative. You are responsible for all your reality through the amazing power of your emotions. What you feel with emotion, you attract. This is what we read in the book, Ask, and it is given by Esther and Jerry Hicks about the Law of Attraction. The Law of Attraction is the most powerful law in the universe. Each thought emits a vibration and emits a signal, which attracts a corresponding signal to it. We call this process the Law of Attraction. Under this law, the birds of a feather flock together. So you might consider this powerful Law of Attraction as some kind of universal management system that ensures that all thoughts of a similar nature align together. You have a demonstration of this principle when you turn on the radio and tune into a station whose signal is transmitted from a transmission tower. Of course, you don't expect to hear the music on FM 101 when your radio receiver is set to FM 98.6. You understand that the transmitted radio frequency must correspond to the tuned radio frequency, which is in accordance with the law of attraction. Therefore, when you experience something that causes you to emit the vibrations of any desire, you must then find a way to keep yourself constantly in vibratory harmony with that desire in order to reap the results. What do you pay attention to? Everything you pay attention to causes you to emit a vibration. And as this is equivalent to a query, it becomes your point of attraction. If there is one thing you want, just focus your attention on it. Under the law of attraction, it will manifest itself to you. 
because by thinking about it or feeling this desire, you emit a vibration from which this thing must necessarily come to you. However, if your attention is focused on the fact that you do not have the desired thing, then the law of attraction will ensure that the result corresponds to this vibration of want, and you will continue to not get what you desire. That is the law. Indeed, while you were with the source energy, your creator, your God, in the non-physical dimension, you chose to enter physical spatio-temporal reality in the company of other beings, and to assume an identity with a clear and precise perspective. The non-physical energy that creates the worlds always flows through your decisions, your intentions and each of your thoughts. You can never be told enough that you must at all costs protect your thoughts from negative thoughts. The Apostle Paul always exhorts us in this sense in these words. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise. Think on these things. Philippians 4 verse 8. Job lived in doubt, a feeling linked to the lowest emotions. Job offered so many particular victims and differed from the general sacrifices offered for the sins of all. This is what he makes hurt, saying, Perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. He is right to say, perhaps, for he only fears this misfortune. In his moments of tribulation, Job exclaims as well. Fear is what happens to me. What I fear is what affects me. Job 3, verse 25. This is explains well the law of attraction as applied in the case of Job. We have understood these words of Job as referring to his whole life course, and assumed that Job meant that he was always worried about some great calamity, such as that which had now come upon him, and that in the time of his highest prosperity, he would have lived in the continual restlessness of losing his possessions, for fear of being reduced to misery and suffering. He said, Even in the time of my peace and prosperity, I was filled with fear. Given the variety of God's providences, the course and variability of this vain world, the infirmities and contingencies of human nature and life, the righteousness of God and the sin of all humanity, and my fears were not in vain, but they are justified by my present calamities, so that I have never enjoyed a healthy tranquility since I was born. And this is why it has not been worth my life, for all my days have been evil and full of vexation and torment either by fear of miseries or by the suffering of them. Vanity of vanities, says Ecclesiastes. Vanity of vanities, everything is vanity. A peculiar false teaching that the enemy or the devil used to exacerbate Job's distress, make his wife despair and inflame his friend's criticism, was the false doctrine of retribution, which teaches that God rewards only those who are good and punishes only those who are evil. Unfortunately, Job believed this false teaching and blamed God for his misfortune, even if he did not deny God or curse him in the face. The doctrine of retribution teaches that the blessings people receive show that they are good people, while the bad things that happen indicate that a person has sinned and needs to repent or do penance to return to the good books of God. This is unbiblical and throws a great insult on God's goodness and grace as he blesses all people both good and bad. The sun is shining on all. The rain is cooling everyone. But this is a belief that is very widespread today. Among some who are considered born-again Christians, God blesses his people. But it is wrong to suggest that the reason why a Christian is going through a difficult period is his sin. We would do well to recognize that and refrain from making judgments that are not ours or criticisms that are not under our sovereignty. God blesses his children. And while we need to confess all sin to the Lord, we should never assume that difficult circumstances are always the result of our fault, as it shows a lack of faith in his word and distrust of his promises. It encourages the non-biblical attitude of salvation or blessing through works. But God's salvation and blessings are a demonstration of God's grace, not our works. Hallelujah. Job was a righteous man, which means he was also a sinner saved by the grace of God. Job trusted God, and his faith was credited as just. Although the evil that happened to him was allowed by God, Job was wrong to plead injustice to the Lord. Nevertheless, his misfortunes had nothing to do with Job's sin, as his friends believed. God is neither the source nor the instigator of evil, even if he allows it in the lives of his children. For our part, we must not fear what might happen to us. 
We are called to trust Him in every difficulty of life and to keep His promises firmly, even when we do not understand. May we be faithful servants who trust in the Lord of all our heart and not rely on our own understanding. May we recognize this in all things and allow the Lord to direct our paths in difficult times as well as in good. Like Job, suffering must not separate us from the love of God. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will it be tribulation or anguish or persecution or hunger or nakedness or peril or sword? According to what is written, it is because of you that we are put to death all day long, that we are looked upon as sheep destined for slaughter. But in all these things, we are more than victors by the one who loved us. For I have the assurance that neither death nor life, nor angels nor dominations, nor present things, nor things to come, nor powers nor height, neither depth nor any other creature can separate us from the love of God manifested in Jesus Christ our Lord. Roma 8 verses 35 to 39. Does suffering really mean anything? Without, however, being like an ancient Greek Stoic or a cynic, we have nevertheless leafed through the scriptures. And here are some examples from the Bible where suffering has different meanings in our spatio-temporal life. 1. Suffering is like punishment. See Deuteronomy 28, 15, 68. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Cursed shalt thou be in the city, and cursed shalt thou be in the field. Cursed shall be thy basket and thy store. Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy land, the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. Cursed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and cursed shalt thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall send upon thee cursing, vexation, and rebuke, in all that thou settest thine hand unto for to do, until thou be destroyed, and until thou perish quickly, because of the wickedness of thy doings, whereby thou hast forsaken me. The Lord shall make the pestilence cleave unto thee, until he have consumed thee from off the land, whither thou goest to possess it. The Lord shall smite thee with a consumption, and with a fever, and with an inflammation, and with an extreme burning, and with a sword, and with blasting, and with mildew. And they shall pursue thee until thou perish. And thy heaven that is over thy head shall be brass, and the earth that is under thee shall be iron. The Lord shall make the rain of thy land powder and dust. From heaven shall it come down upon thee, until thou be destroyed. The Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies. Thou shalt go out one way against them, and flee seven ways before them, and shalt be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. And thy carcass shall be meat unto all fowls of the air, and unto the beasts of the earth, and no man shall fray them away. The Lord will smite thee with the botch of Egypt, and with the emeralds, and with the scab, and with the itch, whereof thou canst not be healed. The Lord shall smite thee with madness, and blindness, and astonishment of heart. And thou shalt grope at noonday, as the blind gropeth in darkness. And thou shalt not prosper in thy ways. And thou shalt be only oppressed and spoiled evermore. And no man shall save thee. Thou shalt betroth a wife, and another man shall lie with her. Thou shalt build an house, and thou shalt not dwell therein. Thou shalt plant a vineyard, and shalt not gather the grapes thereof. Thine ox shall be slain before thine eyes, and thou shalt not eat thereof. Thine ass shall be violently taken away from before thy face, and shall not be restored to thee. Thy sheep shall be given unto thine enemies, and thou shalt have none to rescue them. Thy sons and thy daughters shall be given unto another people, and thine eyes shall look, and fail with longing for them all the day long and there shall be no might in thine hand. The fruit of thy land and all thy labors shall a nation which thou knowest not eat up, and thou shalt be only oppressed and crushed alway, so that thou shalt be mad for the sight of thine eyes which thou shalt see. The Lord shall smite thee in the knees and in the legs with a sore botch that cannot be healed from the sole of thy foot unto the top of thy head. The Lord shall bring thee and thy king which thou shalt set over thee unto a nation which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, and there shalt thou serve other gods, wood and stone. And thou shalt become an astonishment, a proverb, and a byword, among all nations whither the Lord shall lead thee. Thou shalt carry much seed out into the field, and shalt gather but little in. For the locust shall consume it. Thou shalt plant vineyards and dress them, but shalt neither drink of the wine, nor gather the grapes. For the worms shall eat them. Thou shalt have olive trees throughout all thy coasts, but thou shalt not anoint thyself with the oil. 
for thine olive shall cast his fruit. Thou shalt beget sons and daughters, but thou shalt not enjoy them, for they shall go into captivity. All thy trees and fruit of thy land shall the locust consume. The stranger that is within thee shall get up above thee very high, and thou shalt come down very low. He shall lend to thee, and thou shalt not lend to him. He shall be the head, and thou shalt be the tail. Moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee, and shall pursue thee and overtake thee, till thou be destroyed, because thou hearkenest not unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to keep his commandments and his statutes which he commanded thee, and they shall be upon thee for a sign and for a wonder, and upon thy seed forever. Because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart, for the abundance of all things, therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies which the Lord shall send against thee, in hunger, and in thirst, and in nakedness, and in want of all things, and he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck, until he have destroyed thee. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand, a nation of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the person of the old, nor show favor to the young, and he shall eat the fruit of thy cattle, and the fruit of thy land, until thou be destroyed, which also shall not leave thee either corn, wine, or oil, or the increase of thy kind, or flocks of thy sheep, until he have destroyed thee. And he shall besiege thee in all thy gates, until thy high and fenced walls come down, wherein thou trustest, throughout all thy land. And he shall besiege thee in all thy gates, throughout all thy land, which the Lord thy God hath given thee. And thou shalt eat the fruit of thine own body, the flesh of thy sons and of thy daughters, which the Lord thy God hath given thee, in the siege, and in the straightness, wherewith thine enemies shall distress thee, so that the man that is tender among you, and very delicate, his eye shall be evil toward his brother, and toward the wife of his bosom, and toward the remnant of his children which he shall leave, so that he will not give to any of them of the flesh of his children whom he shall eat, because he hath nothing left him in the siege, and in the straightness, wherewith thine enemies shall distress thee in all thy gates. The tender and delicate woman among you, which would not adventure to set the sole of her foot upon the ground for delicateness and tenderness. Her eye shall be evil toward the husband of her bosom, and toward her son, and toward her daughter, and toward her young one that cometh out from between her feet, and toward her children which she shall bear, for she shall eat them for want of all things secretly in the siege and straightness, wherewith thine enemy shall distress thee in thy gates. If thou wilt not observe to do all the words of this law that are written in this book, that thou mayest fear this glorious and fearful name, the Lord thy God. Then the Lord will make thy plagues wonderful, and the plagues of thy seed, even great plagues, and of long continuance, and sore sicknesses, and of long continuance. Moreover, he will bring upon thee all the diseases of Egypt, which thou wast afraid of, and they shall cleave unto thee. Also every sickness, and every plague, which is not written in the book of this law, them will the Lord bring upon thee, until thou be destroyed. And ye shall be left few in number, whereas ye were as the stars of heaven for multitude, because thou wouldest not obey the voice of the Lord thy God. And it shall come to pass, that as the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good and to multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you, and to bring you to naught. And ye shall be plucked from off the land whither thou goest to possess it. And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people, from the one end of the earth even unto the other. And there thou shalt serve other gods, which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. And among these nations shalt thou find no ease, neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest. But the Lord shall give thee there a trembling heart, and failing of eyes, and sorrow of mind. Life shall hang in doubt before thee, and thou shalt fear day and night, and shalt have none assurance of thy life. In the morning thou shalt say, Would God it were even! And at even thou shalt say, Would God it were morning! For the fear of thine heart wherewith thou shalt fear, and for the sight of thine eyes which thou shalt see. And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships, by the way whereof I spake unto thee. Thou shalt see it no more again, and there ye shall be sold unto your enemies for bondmen and bondwomen, and no man shall buy you. 2. Suffering has value in our life after death. 2 Corinthians 4 16 18. That is why we do not lose courage. And even if our outer being is destroyed, our inner being is renewed day by day. Indeed, our slight difficulties of the present moment produce for us, beyond all measure, an eternal weight of glory. So we look not at what is visible, but at what is invisible, because the visible realities are transient, and the invisible are eternal. 
3. Suffering is a school. See Hebrews 5, 7, 10. During his earthly life, Christ presented with loud cries and tears of prayer and supplication to him, who could save him from death, and he was granted because of his piety. Thus, although he was a son, he learned obedience by what he suffered. And perfectly qualified, he became for all those who obey him the author of eternal salvation, for God declared him high priest in the manner of Melchizedek. 4. Suffering is a test of faith. See James 1, 2, 3. My brothers and sisters, consider as a subject of complete joy the various trials to which you may be exposed, knowing that testing your faith produces perseverance. But perseverance must accomplish its task perfectly so that you are perfectly qualified, without defect, and that you lack nothing. 5. The exemplary suffering of faithful witnesses in 2 Timothy 3, 12, 13. Moreover, all those who want to live with piety in Jesus Christ will be persecuted, while the wicked and impostors will advance ever more in evil, leading others astray and going astray themselves. 6. Suffering makes you strong. See 2 Corinthians 12, 7, 9. And that I might not be swollen with pride because of the excellence of these revelations, I was put a splinter in the flesh, an angel of Satan to blow me away and prevent me from boasting. Three times I prayed to the Lord to take him away from me. And he said to me, My grace is enough for you, for my power is fulfilled in weakness. Therefore I will gladly glorify myself of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. In conclusion, the trials that we have to endure in this life are after all light and ephemeral. They prepare us for eternity a fullness of glory that exceeds all that we can imagine. 2 Corinthians 4 16, 18 that is why nothing can bring down our courage and why we do not weaken. On the contrary, if our bodies become exhausted and deteriorate outwardly, we are renewed and clothed with new strength from day to day. The trials we have to endure in this life are, after all, light and ephemeral. They prepare us for eternity, for a fullness of glory beyond anything we can imagine. So we do not attach our gaze to visible things, but to invisible realities. What we can see lasts only for a time, Invisible realities remain forever, and we therefore profit from our suffering. Jesus himself experienced suffering. During his earthly life, Christ presented with loud cries and tears of prayer and supplication to him, who could save him from death, and he was granted because of his piety. Thus, although he was a son, he learned obedience by what he suffered. And perfectly qualified, he became for all those who obey him the author of eternal salvation, for God declared him high priest in the manner of Melchizedek. Hebrews 5, verses 7-9. If Jesus, though the eternal Son of God, has gone through the school of suffering, we are warned that we too will have to go through that school. What did Jesus learn? At this school, he learned obedience. As for us, in the school of suffering we can learn humility, forgiveness, recognition, love, faithfulness. The fact that the Bible tells us that Jesus learned obedience is as if God was pointing to one of the most difficult lessons to learn. Obedience. Through his obedience, Jesus became the source of salvation for the world, and therefore for each one of us. When suffering is useful, one of the most deadly diseases is cancer. Why? Because cancer during the first phase of its development is painless. There is no such alarm signal as pain, and unfortunately, this lack of suffering leads to a dangerous lack of vigilance. Some people are completely insensitive to pain due to brain damage or genetic factors. This lack of pain, instead of being a chance, is a major problem. Without suffering, there are no more warning signs and the risk of missing out on a serious illness is incurred. Some sufferings can have the utility of making us aware of a deep evil buried deep in our being, sin. Then we are able to apply the proper treatment the blood of Jesus which cleanses us from all sin. 1 John 1 verse 7. Suffering makes us unshakable. God of all grace has called you in Jesus Christ to his eternal glory. After you have suffered a little while, he will restore you. The rain has fallen, the torrents have come, the winds have blown and unleashed against this house. It has not collapsed because it was founded on the rock. But anyone who hears these words I say and does not put them into practice will look like a madman who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the torrents came, the winds blew and fell on this house. It collapsed, and its ruin was great. 
Jesus reminds us that the true test of a house is its strength in the face of trials. If the invisible part of the construction is neglected, that is the foundation. Sooner or later, the building will collapse. If we build our lives by putting into practice the words of Jesus, our sufferings will not destroy us. We will remain rooted in this hope of the kingdom that comes. Turn evil into good. We read in Psalms 84, 6, 7. Blessed are those who find their strength in you. They find in their hearts paths that have been laid out. When they cross the valley of tears, they turn it into a place full of springs, and the rain also covers it with blessings. Because the Apostle Paul understood this, he wrote, All things work for the good of those who love God. Romans 8, 28. Yes, all things, the good, the pleasant, but also the sufferings, the pains, the tears, and the dramas. It is important to learn to read sadness. We all know what sadness is, but can we read it? Do we understand what this means to me, this sadness of today? In our time, it is sadness, most often considered in a negative way, as an evil to flee at all costs, when it can be an essential alarm signal for life, inviting us to explore landscapes richer and more fertile than fugacity and escape allow. St. Thomas defines sadness as a pain of the soul, as nerves for the body. It awakens our attention to a possible danger or a neglected good. It is therefore indispensable to our health. It protects us so that we do not harm ourselves and others. It would be much more serious and dangerous not to feel this feeling and move forward. Sadness sometimes plays the role of a red light. Stop, stop. It's red. Stop. For whom instead has the desire to do good? Sadness is an obstacle with which the tempter wants to discourage us. In this case, we must act in exactly the opposite way to what is being suggested, determined to continue what was proposed. Think of work, study, prayer, a commitment made. If we abandoned them as soon as we felt boredom or sadness, we would never finish anything. It is also a common experience in spiritual life. The way to good, the gospel reminds us, is narrow and steep. It requires a struggle, a victory over oneself. Spiritual life, trial is an important moment. The Bible explicitly reminds us of this and says, if you claim to serve the Lord, prepare yourself for trial. If you want to go in the right direction, prepare yourself. There will be obstacles, there will be temptations, there will be moments of sadness. It is like when a teacher passes an exam to a student, if he sees that he knows the essential points of the subject, he does not insist, he has passed the test, but he must pass the test. If we know how to go through loneliness and desolation with openness and awareness, we can emerge strengthened on the human and spiritual plane. No trial is beyond our reach. No trial will be greater than what we can do. But we must not run away from trials. See what this trial means, what it means that I am sad. Why am I sad? What does it mean that I am in desolation right now? What does it mean that I am in desolation and I cannot move forward? St. Paul reminds us that no one is tempted beyond his ability because the Lord never abandons us and with him at our side we can overcome every temptation. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 And if we do not overcome it today, we rise up, we walk, and we will overcome it tomorrow. But not to remain dead, so to speak, not to remain defeated because of a moment of sadness, of desolation. Go forward. We must not throw in the towel. The support of heaven is guaranteed. As we pointed out in our previous video, while you were with the Source Energy, your Creator, your God, in the non-physical dimension before your incarnation, you opted to enter into the spatio-temporal physical reality in the company of other beings and assume an identity with a clear and precise perspective. The other beings of pure and positive energy, having unconditional love, are ready to help you with their infinite mercy. While the other beings of low energy, demons, would rather parasitize you and enjoy your energy, for in the universe, or rather in the multiverse that surrounds you, everything is energy. The non-physical energy that creates the worlds always flows through your decisions, your intentions and each of your thoughts. During the history of spirituality, we have seen how the angels, the ascended masters, including Jesus and even Jehovah himself, visited men to strengthen them during their various tribulations. You are on the battlefield, but rejoice and have unshakable faith for an army of angels and other celestial beings, including the Virgin Mary, with their infinite mercy and their unconditional love, are always at your side to support you to reach your perfection. For as the Apostle Paul says well in Romans 5, 
verses 1 to 5. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Chris, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience, experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. According to an ancient tradition, Christians have always thought of the seven sorrows of the Blessed Virgin, moments in her life when, being totally united to her son Jesus, she took part especially in the depth of the suffering and love of her sacrifice. Christians traditionally remember the seven sorrows of the Blessed Virgin. First pain, the prophecy of Simeon. Simeon took the child in his arms and blessed God and said to Mary his mother, Behold, your son who is there will cause the fall and upliftment of many in Israel. It will be a sign of division. And you, your heart will be pierced by a sword. This famous flaming sword that prevented Adam and Eve from approaching the tree of life in Genesis 3.24 was discarded by the new Adam, Jesus Christ, and the new Eve, the Virgin Mary. Our Lady listens attentively to what God wants of her. She meditates on what she does not even understand. She questions what she does not know. Then she applies herself with all her being to fulfill the divine will with her precious and humble words, I am the servant of the Lord. May it happen to me according to your word. What a wonder! Mary, our example in all things, now teaches us that obedience to God is not servility, that it does not subjugate our conscience. On the contrary, it impels us inwardly to discover the freedom of the children of God. The second pain, the flight to Egypt. The third pain, Jesus lost in the temple. The fourth pain, Mary finds her son on the way to Calvary. The fifth pain, Jesus dies on the cross. The sixth pain, Jesus came down from the cross and handed over to his mother. The seventh pain, Jesus is put in the tomb. When the mother of the word appeared in Kibiho, Rwanda, she entrusted us with the Rosary of the Seven Sorrows by Marie Claire in 1982. They said several things. She told him, among other things, that it was on May 31, 1982, about three months after the first apparition to her. What I'm asking you to do is to repent, to convert. If you recite this rosary well while meditating on it, you will find the strength to come back to God. Today, the world no longer knows how to ask forgiveness. He continues to crucify the Son of God on the cross. Two months later, she reassured him. It was July 21, 1982, Know that I am with you all the time and that I accompany you throughout the days. Let us remember that the Virgin Mary does not take the place of Jesus. But, as she tells us through her, when she comes to us, it is her son who sends her. She will direct the spirit of our prayer through Nathalie, another seer from Kibiho in Rwanda, saying that she is not a deity to be worshipped. This means that she is the servant of the Lord, yet capable of interceding for us. In Kibiho, Rwanda, Mary invites us to learn from her to contemplate the face of Christ through this rosary. And she accompanies us with her example of the faithful who served the Lord body and soul every day of her life. The Virgin Mary said to Alfonsin, another seer from Kibiho in Rwanda, on the 15th of August, 1983 and the 28th of November, 1983, pray tirelessly for the church, for great tribulations await her in the coming times. Indeed, as Saint Irenaeus says, through her obedience, the Virgin Mary became a cause of salvation for herself and for the whole human race. In this way, she faithfully kept her union with her son until the cross where, not without a divine plan, she stood, suffering deeply with her only begotten son and associating herself motherly with his sacrifice, lovingly consenting to the self-immolation of the victim she had engendered. The saints and doctors of all time spoke of Mary's communion in the sufferings of her son. Saint Bernardino of Siena said that at the same time as the son sacrificed his body, the mother sacrificed her soul. Saint Jerome says that the wounds in the son's body were as numerous as the wounds in the mother's heart. Another author adds that the wounds that were spread in the son's body were all united in the mother's heart, since the cross and nails also belong to the mother, because with the crucified Christ, the mother was also crucified. As his love for Jesus is somehow infinite, Infinite was also his pain. That is why the church applies the words of the Old Testament to her. What can we say about you? What can we compare you to daughter of Jerusalem? How can you make yourself equal to console yourself, virgin, daughter of Zion? 
for your misfortune is as great as the sea. Who then will heal you? See in Lamentations 2 verse 13. Mary suffers for us, for her children. On Calvary, Mary also suffered for us, for her children. It is precisely there that the Lord entrusted her to the Apostle John. This is your mother. But above all, he entrusted John to Mary, and in him, he entrusted all humanity to her. Here is your son. John 19 verses 26 to 27, as the Constitution Lumen Gentium emphasizes. Thus, her maternal function expanded, assuming universal dimensions on Calvary. St. John Paul II said it splendidly in Fatima. From the moment when Jesus, dying on the cross, said to John, Here is your mother. From the time when the disciple took her home, the mystery of Mary's spiritual motherhood has had its fulfillment in history with an amplitude without frontiers. Motherhood means caring for her son's life. In Christ, she accepted John under the cross, and in him, she accepted every man and all men. Thus, the mystery of Mary's motherhood, extended to all men, was not fulfilled without pain. The universal law of motherhood which God had imposed on Eve after the original fall, you will give birth in pain, Genesis 3 verse 16, was fulfilled in Mary, the virgin of sorrows, the new Eve, the new mother of all the living. Genesis 3 verse 20. But in an entirely new way, that is, not in the virginal birth of Jesus, but when she begat us in union with her son sacrificed on the cross. It was her motherly concern for us that prompted Mary most holy to come to Fatima, to Kibiho, and to different parts of the world. It is his mother's pain that compels him to speak. The fate of his children is at stake, because Satan and his hell are really real, and neuroscience and quantum mechanics have also proved it. See our previous video. Virgin Mary spoke of her sorrows in certain revelations recognized by the Church. In the 14th century, she promised St. Bridget of Sweden to grant special graces to those who meditate on her sorrows, peace in their families, enlightenment on the divine mysteries, consolation in their sufferings, granted requests if they do not oppose God's will, defense against the devil, assistance at the moment of death, eternal joy in Jesus and Mary. In 1982, the Virgin spoke of the Rosary of the Seven Sorrows in her apparitions in Kibiho, Rwanda. What I ask you to do is to repent. If you recite this rosary while meditating on it, you will have the strength to repent, she told a seer from Kibiho in Rwanda, Marie-Claire Mumangango, on May 31, 1982. Convert, believe in the good news, believe that God loves you. That's all. As our heavenly support is guaranteed, let us meditate on the comforts of the Apostle Paul to Timothy. Remember Jesus Christ, from the seed of David, risen from the dead, according to my gospel, for whom I suffer to the point of being bound as a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. That is why I bear everything because of the elect, so that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Jesus Christ, with eternal glory. This word is certain. If we die with him, we will also live with him. If we persevere, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he too will deny us. If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful, because he cannot deny himself. Remember these things, by conjuring before God that we avoid arguments of words, which only serve to ruin those who listen. Strive to present yourself before God as a tried man, a worker who has nothing to blush, who rightly dispenses the word of truth. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to press the like, share, and subscribe button to our channel, and ring the bell to be notified for new videos available. To the next video.